we would uh, pack up in the mountains uh, back in a wilderness area called the Gospel Hump Wilderness Area, and, and I'd hunt elk. In fact, uh, Idaho was one of the few states that had early bugle rifle season. Um, usually early season is always for the bow hunters, but this was early bugle rifle season. And uh, it was after I would got my um, first back operation, I seem to collect those the way some people collect coins. But um, anyway, um, uh, this doctor had kind of carried me through, and he got to be a good friend, and he didn't charge us anything for a year and a half until um, the court case was settled of uh, my accident. And so he just kind of carried us on the books, which was nice, helped me through that time before I got a back operation. So as kind of a reward to him, I said I'd take him back as we'd pack him with horses and mules back there, and I'd try to bugle him in a bowl. I told you I'd tell a hunting story this morning, Joe. <laughs> so um, him and I and my hunting partner, Rick, who's just like a brother, uh, were just going to go, the three of us. And he said he had a friend coming out from back east, and this friend of his wanted to be a pastor. And at that time, I wasn't pastoring. I was just a director. At a, at a Bible camp, and then I was helping churches in whichever way they needed help, and one of the areas was helping them find pastors, good pastors, qualified pastors, and pastors that truly wanted to pastor. And so he said, yeah, I got this guy, and he's looking to relocate. He lived out on the East Coast. He said he wanted to move out west, him and his family, and he wanted to be a pastor. And so... <laughs> My buddy Rick said, well, why don't we just bring him along and we'll get to know him. I thought, well, I guess, yeah, because in a week up there hunting, we'd get to know who he was, he'd get to know who we were. So, so we took this guy. Well, he was a city boy, so that, that was kind of a problem in and of itself because we're out in the dingwoods. No electricity, no running water, you know, it's just kind of out there. And so he was out there. And, and the uh, first day we took him hunting, and I went with the doctor. Um, my buddy Rick went hunting by himself, and I took the doctor out to view him in a bowl, and this guy came along. And uh, I don't know why, but as we walked out there in the forest, he picked up a stick, and every tree we'd go by, and whack it. <laughs> yeah, if you know anything about hunting, if you usually whack the trees, the elk are not going to stick around. They tend to... And so he was doing that thing, and, you know, I, I didn't just get to know him, so I didn't want to say anything, but this doctor, who was his friend, they grew up together as kids, went to school together, he really got annoyed with this guy. He finally turned around to him, would you quit whacking the trees? We want to see some elk. Well, as the week went on, this guy did a lot of that type of We'd get ready to go to bed. You know, you'd go to bed early because you had to get up early if you're going to get out there and see any elk. Um, we'd be in our sleep bags ready to go to bed. This guy would be up just whacking things around, doing yeah. stuff. And he was just getting on all our nerves, you know. Just one of those guys who go, I don't know, you know. And he was a disc jockey at a Christian radio station. And back east, he had went and spoke at a little church. He preached at a little church. And this is why he thought he wanted to be a pastor. And so as the week went on, and he just kept doing these things, and it was the doctor's responsibility. Um, Rick and I met with a doctor out in the woods and said, it's your responsibility. you got to deal with him. Because um, he hit split wood at you know, 11 o'clock at night. We'd be trying to get some sleep. And uh, so as the week went on, I finally got, the, I guess, the guts to ask him, why do you want to be a pastor? And this is what he told me. He says, uh, I thought it would be a good gig. <laughs> yeah. And I knew right then and there, and so did my buddy Rick, who was a pastor as well, that this guy was not pastoral material. And uh, in love, when we got done hunting and we all headed home, I told him that I, I couldn't recommend him for a church. And his heart was broken. Um, 
In this passage that we finally have come to, Christ has preached through the Sermon on the Mount here. He's still preaching on it. And he talked about how you need to be first poor in spirit. You can re need to recognize that you are a sinner. And the difference between believers and non-believers is believers are sinners saved by grace. Non-believers are just sinners. And we need to understand that. In the book of Ephesians, it tells us we need to look at it back at how we used to be, and then we'd have a good, patient attitude and be more willing to share the gospel when we look at people that are not saved. We constantly need to be reminded of our sin. And we need to confess our sins as we do it. Because as the one black pastor said, confess them as you do them, don't let them stack up. And when I heard him preach on that, I sat there and thought, that's a good thing for me to keep in mind as a pastor. Jesus says in effect here, as you strive to enter that narrow gate and walk that narrow path that leads to life, be aware of those who will mislead you. Just as there was a misleading gate in a misleading way, there will also be misleading preachers and teachers who will point to the gate and promote that broad way that leads to hell. Just like the false gate and the way they will claim to show the way to heaven and life but they actually show the way to hell and destruction. The false gate has false prophets standing in front of that gate who want to seek to mislead people into a false way and hinder them from entering the true gate. In this present passage, our Lord gives first a warning and then calls us to be watchful as his children. Just as he described the true and false ways, he now describes true and false teachers. He says first here, beware of the false prophets. And notice what he says, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They look like sheep, they might even talk like a sheep, but they're not a sheep. They're ravenous wolves. Now, um, Steve's not a sheep farmer. We were never a sheep farmer. Yeah. I was never either. My wife was in sheep. In fact, we always had a joke as we were driving down the highway, wherever we were going. And if I would see sheep up there in the pasture, I'd go, what's that smell? Because my dad was into cows. And Linda go, I smell money. <laughs> I don't know if sheep actually stink. I never raised them. So. But anyway, they will look like shepherds, but will be ravenous wolves. You know, false prophets were not new to Israel. As long as God had true prophets, Satan has always had false prophets. They are seen from the earliest times of redemptive history. In fact, Moses warned in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, he said this, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning what he has spoken to you, saying, Let's go after other gods whom you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. And then he says this, For the Lord your God is testing you. Why did God allow false prophets among the children of Israel? It says here, For the Lord God is testing you to find out your love for your Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And then he warned them, you shall not follow, um, you shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, cling to him. But that prophet or dreamer of dreams 
shall be put to death. I'll bet you didn't have a lot of people saying, hmm, I think I want to be a prophet. <laughs> yeah, if they turned out to be a false one, they had a rock concert. They took them out and stoned them. And that's what happened to false prophets. And the children of Israel were told, were told to put them to death. You know, false prophets started right at the beginning. Satan started putting out a false message after Genesis 3. And you see in that dialogue between Satan and Eve, what does Satan do? Did God really say that? And Satan still has that same message today to mankind. As Jesus said on the Mount of Olives shortly before the last Passover week, he asked his disciples, his disciples asked, tell us when will these things, he talked about the destruction of the temple, and, and they said, tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Jesus replied, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the cross, and will, list, and will mislead many, it says. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show you great signs and wonders, so to mislead you, if possible, even the elect. Even the elect. Paul warned the Roman believers. In Romans, he says this. It's Romans 16 and 17. He says, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learn. And turn away from them, for such men are slaves, not of the Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their, notice what he says next, I thought this was interesting, by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. In other parts of the New Testament, false prophets are spoken of as deceitful spirits. Hmm. Makes you wonder where they come from, right? Who say, who advocate doctrines of demons. That's 1 Timothy 4.1. And as those who secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. And that's out of 2 Peter 2. They are called false brothers. False apostles, false teachers, false speakers. And that word speaker, that was interesting, it means liars. False witnesses, false Christ. In fact, the apostle John tells us, he said, Beloved, he's talking to Christians there, he said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Test them by the Word of God. When someone's preaching or teaching, hopefully you have your Bible open to see if they're preaching from the Word of God. How are many people deceived? Because they don't have the test, the standard, the rule by which we measure what they're saying in front of us. One pastor said this, there has always been a large market for false prophets in our day and age because most people do not want to hear the truth. The majority of religious people can't handle sound doctrine. That word sound means healthy, beneficial. And then he goes on and says this, they prefer to hear what is pleasant and flattering here comes that word again, flattery. Even if it's false and dangerous over what is unpleasant and unflattering, even if it is true and helpful. Now, I don't know what situation this pastor was in that made this quote, but he's probably dealing with some false prophets, some false teachers. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy, when I preached through it, couple years ago, I talked about it's really a prophetic book for the church. And it is. 
and it talks about many things. It talks about first, you'll see it, it talks about in the beginning of that book, if you haven't read through 2 Timothy 1, it talks about we need to preach sound doctrine. In other words, what comes from the Bible. And then he says in 2 Timothy 4, after he in 2 Timothy 3 de describes the characteristics of people in the last days, and just read that characteristic, you'll see it fits pretty well. He says this in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. He said to Timothy, he said, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers. In the old King James, it says, heap up. A heap is a large pile. A great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, legends, things that are not biblical. Unfortunately, we've already arrived at that period of time. From the beginning of God's redemptive work on behalf of fallen mankind, his true representatives have been marked by two things. Prophets in the Old Testament were marked by two things. They are divinely commissioned or called by God. And the second thing is they declare the message that God gave them that only that message that God gave them. A true prophet is God's voice to mankind <coughs> preaching on God's Word. Preaching on this. This is our textbook. And you know what? In other countries, I used to hear missionaries years ago talking about, they go to other foreign countries and they would take the Word of God and when it was translated into these people's different language, and when these people got even just one chapter, they considered it very precious. In America, we have the Word of God readily available to us. And I wonder sometimes if we consider that Word that you're holding in your hands, hopefully, as precious. Because it is. The Bible is God's message to mankind. Amen. It's the message about who He is as God, His salvation message, how He sent His one and only Son to die on the cross for your sins, so that you could go to heaven to be with him. It's a love letter, one pastor said, and it truly is. You know what the most dangerous characteristic is about these false prophets? Is that they too claim to speak from God and to speak on his behalf. In fact, Jeremiah had an interesting minister. I don't know if he, Jeremiah had one convert. Of course, I know he did because God has always kept a faithful remnant amongst his people. But it says this in Jeremiah 5, 30 and 31. And this is God speaking. He said, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests rule on their own authority. And then he said this, which is shocking. He said, and my people love it so. Wow. Again, he said to Jeremiah, he said, The prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them nor commanded them nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. Now, I don't know about you, I don't think a lot of us would say, boy, I wish I was Jeremiah. <laughs> no. Such false shepherds are a greater danger to the flock than wild animals, Christ is saying there, because they come in among them as their protector. And that's what a shepherd did. Sheep have no defensive mechanism, you might say. When sheep are threatened, guess what they do? They don't try to fight. They run away. That's what they do. They're not able to defend themselves. 
And that's why God called shepherds to take care of them, to fend off those ravenous wolves. These such false shepherds come under the guise of the one who's supposed to feed and care for the sheep, and instead they slaughter them and devour them. And that's what wolves do. Wolves see a sheep and they don't go, hmm, I think I'll protect this poor defenseless animal. No, they look at a sheep and they go, dinner. That's what a false shepherd does. And that is a picture of the Antichrist who is the prototype of all false prophets. We are heading towards a direction when a false prophet and the Antichrist come on the scene and then you throw Satan in the mix. You have the unholy trinity like we have the Trinity. And it deceives the majority of the world. Just read 2 Thessalonians. Most of the people will drink that false Kool-Aid, you might say. Let me give you a false teacher and a false church, which is an example from our day and age. Most of us are older, so we should remember this. Um, and let me just give this to you. And this comes out of a guy's book. And he says this. He says, one of the most frightening discoveries about the People's Temple Christian Church was that a large majority of its members, and get this, this just amazed me, had been raised in Christian homes of one sort or another. Most of those who joined the church did so in the belief that it offered a higher and more genuine experience of Christian fellowship and service. Yet the church dissolved overnight when its leader, Jim Jones, and nearly a thousand of its most loyal followers committed mass suicide at Jonestown, a remote church settlement in the jungles of Guyana, South America. He started in Los Angeles. And then he moved down there because he kept having a problem with the city officials and its police department. In his book, Deceived by Mel White, he tries to determine why so many people could be misled. In fact, entire families were misled. And among the reasons he suggests this, he says he, Jim Jones, knew how to inspire people. He was committed to people in need. He counseled prisoners and juvenile delinquents. He started a job placement center. He opened rest homes and homes for the mentally ill. He had health clinics. He organized a vocational <coughs> training center. He provided free legal aid. He founded a community center. He preached about God and even claimed to cast out demons and do miracles and heal. But on the other hand, we find all the marks of a false prophet. He promoted himself through the use of celebrities, a very common vehicle for false prophets to gain credibility. He manipulated the press. He wanted a certain favorable stories. He was big on playing the press. And he used the language and forms of faith to gain his power. If you ever heard of listen, and they actually have it, um, it was a PBS special they put out years ago after this thing happened. And you listen to his sermons that he first preached, and you go, this guy's saved. I listened to it. I watched the whole thing. It was like an hour and a half, two hours long, this PBS special. And, and I was shocked. I heard about this stuff. I knew he was a false prophet. But I didn't realize how good he was at getting out Satan's message. Mel White goes on in his book and says, Jim Jones created a warm, purposeful Christian community, but he replaced Jesus Christ as the authority and more and more garnered loyalty to himself. He been, began demanding Monday for every service he offered and was preoccupied with sex in both its normal and deviant forms. He would lie convincingly about anything in order to gain an advantage 
or make a desired impression. Before his bizarre death, he had managed to gain the admiration and praises of countless church leaders, governors, senators, congressmen, and even the president of the United States. You know what the greatest tragedy is, other than the thousand people that committed suicide? Is they committed suicide and they died believing they were serving God. In truth, they were serving Satan and were on their way to hell if they did not know Christ as their personal Savior. And if there were any believers, any believers who may have been among them, they incurred great loss of reward. For false Christ and false prophets will arise, Jesus warned. In fact, Jude declares that certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Notice that phrase, crept in unnoticed. Those who were long before marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. In fact, if you read the book of Jude, it's a good read. He says, I would rather talk about the common salvation we have. He would rather have given out a positive message instead of the message he gave out. And Jude was Christ's half-brother. And he gave out this message. In fact, when Jesus was alive, it says that his brothers didn't believe him. The scribes and the Pharisees were classic examples of false shepherds. In the name of leading and caring for God's people, they instead led them further and further away from his ways. Posing as God's spokesman, they used the people to feather their own ecclesiastical nests and cared nothing for the people that God called them to serve. They were ravenous wolves, self-seeking and self-serving. And when Jesus confronted them about their deceit and hypocrisy, it's no wonder you can see why they had him crucified. Their lives, their jobs, and their comfort was threatened. Let no one deceive you with empty words, Paul warns the Ephesians. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. That seems to imply that even Christians can follow false prophets. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. He said in Colossians. In this passage back in Ephesians, he says, Therefore do ye not be partakers with them. We need to be very careful in this last day and age with the messages we listen to. Paul's last words to the Ephesian elders when he met them and said goodbye on the beach near Miletus, he included a sober warning about an inevitable false teachers that would come in among them. And he said this message, he said, crying. He said, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. 